Some months ago, the distinguished Australian soprano, Joan Sutherland, with her husband, paid a visit to the home of the great singer of the past, Amelita Gallicocci. In this recording, made at Miss Sutherland's home in London, she describes the visit and introduces some of Gallicocci's records. <laughs> Last November, when my husband and myself were in America, we met Gallicucci, the idol of my childhood. It was in Los Angeles, really. I was lying in bed in the hotel room, just resting, when the phone rang. Usually, I don't answer the telephone myself at all. But this morning, for some reason, I reached for the receiver. And when I heard who was on the other end of the line, I nearly dropped it again. It was Amelita Gallicucci herself. voice was a wonderful sensation, and she was so sweet. She asked Richard and myself to her ranch near San Diego for a short visit, and although it was a long trip, we decided then and there that we simply had to go. After all, it was like the realization of a dream that one thinks could never come true. We'd admired her so much for as long as we both could remember, and now an invitation. It was almost too exciting. We couldn't go straight away. The next day, which happened to be my birthday, Richard and I had to go to San Francisco where we were giving a recital in the opera house. The day after was to be our big day. We caught a plane from San Francisco to Los Angeles in the morning and had a car waiting at the airport so we couldn't waste any time. As we had to drive through Los Angeles proper, we stopped for lunch, which we had with Silvio Varviso, who later conducted Lucia when I made my debut at the Met, and also Renato Cioni, who was then singing Edgardo in Lucia. I don't know exactly what the distance is between Los Angeles and the ranch, but it must be quite a few hundred miles, and we really moved quickly when we started off again. We arrived about four o'clock and were so excited we had to get out of the car very slowly, or we'd have tumbled out in a hurry. It was a beautiful ranch, but we really didn't notice much about it then. We just headed for the door and knocked. It opened and there she was, Amelita Gallicucci in person. 
My first impression was of a tiny, friendly, pink woman. She was dressed entirely in pink, and it was all the same shade, too. Pink ballet slippers, pink slacks, pink blouse, pink cardigan, even pink beads around her neck. Somehow, pink seems to belong to her. She writes on pink paper, and I was so delighted with her that when I later went to New York, I ordered some pink writing paper for myself by way of being a memento. She has beautiful white hair and it was most elaborately dressed and held up with tortoiseshell combs about the only thing that she had on that wasn't pink. When I think back, she appeared to me as ageless. Some people seem to be. They never lose interest in things around them and so they're always interesting themselves. I found her just that. She was so full of vitality as she is in this charming record of La Cabinera. She chatted for a while, and then she showed us around her house. Actually, it's a bungalow type of building. There are quite a lot of them in that part, where there is a great Spanish influence from the early settlers in that part of America. Inside was decorated in the Florentine style, with some beautiful antiques around. The whole place was most tastefully done, and she had decorated it all herself. It looked simple, yet luxurious, if one can put these two words together. Her studio was quite small. It had in it a piano which was covered with music. She has, in fact, actually gone back to the piano. She did very well as a young person. There were several portraits of herself, painted when she was in her heyday, and literally dozens of her own paintings, mostly still life and landscapes, and very charming. What really caught my eye was a marble bust of hers, Violetta, the heroine of Verdi's opera La Tariata. Thank you. 
room with windows overlooking the valley. There was a big log fire burning and it all looked very comfortable. The furniture was old Italian, so were the paintings, and there were bits and pieces that she collected from all over the world. She made tea for us herself in a beautiful silver teapot, and it was real tea too. She didn't drown a little bag in hot water. And we were ready for it. We wandered through many subjects over tea, music of course, art, we talked about herself for quite a while because we were so interested and then clipped into and around music again. I asked her how many discs she'd made and she told me she'd recorded 150 titles. We told her that our favourite of her early recordings was Io son Titania. She was very pleased that we'd chosen that particular one and agreed that it probably was her best.
me, we went outside for a while just to look around. We hadn't really noticed a thing when we arrived, and we could have been sitting on top of Mount Everest. We weren't, but we were pretty high, overlooking the valley, and there were a lot of eucalypts around. In fact, they were the only trees I did notice. Perhaps because they looked so familiar. There are so many in Australia. Nita, that is what her friends call her, and she asked us to do as well, was very good-natured and patient when Richard produced his camera. He bought a new film especially for the occasion, and because he was so anxious to take something worthwhile, he snapped through the whole film on every different exposure he could think of. I'm sure he can't remember what he did now, but some of the photos are gems. They're very treasured souvenirs indeed. And so, for me especially, is this aria from Bellini's La Sonambula, one of my very favorite operas. a lot of special things to me. She mentioned that she thought my best Dinora would be a good role for me to sing, and someday I hope I shall sing it. 
She also gave me a great deal of good advice, gave it so nicely and so sincerely that I hope I may always be able to live by it. I have to use her own words for part of it, as near as I can remember. She told me to set myself a goal and to take no notice of what anybody might say, so long as I believed I was right, and to head straight for that goal. Then, in her most delightful accent, she said, You must, how do you say, put on the blinders like the horse, and keep on looking straight ahead. She also gave me the rule of the three S's by which to live, and I wish I could remember them as well as she has, most obviously. They are sincerity, serenity, and simplicity. So let's end with Gallicucci singing the best verse of Act One of Dinora, which I hope one day I shall sing in homage to her. Thank you.